MC Harvey, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure. That was a good, that was a good intro. Though. Do you like that? Yeah, <laughs> it was good. Let's rewind to the beginning. I didn't want to be a musician. I come from a council estate, bro. South London. Were you a naughty boy? I was both. One thing that my mum's friends always would say was that I had manners. That's what people don't understand about So Solid. It was all organic. It's from the streets. It's music from the heart. It's music from struggle. Presenting changed my life. I interviewed Jackie Chan, Spike Lee, Jennifer Lopez, How Berry. I've done the VMAs. Presented awards at the Mobos. People started to see my character. Oh, he's actually a fun guy. He's normal. Because I'd walk into a building and people think, I'm gonna shoot him. That's when I shot my first film with Steven Seagal, Out for a Kill. Me and him had to stare out for about two minutes. I'm thinking, fuck, I'm done. <laughs> and he went, I like you. I walked off. And I'm going, <laughs> um, Death Warrant. Oh, come on, man. You're talking all my classic <laughs> films, bro. <laughs> Me and him went out for dinner, and then his LAPD guy said, like, you know, he's like, strap that gun in his waist. And I'm like, <laughs> Guys, Matt Haycock's here, and welcome to another episode of The Matt Haycock Show. And today, I hope we've got a lot more than 21 seconds, because we're going to need them, because my guest is none other than MC Harvey, the British rapper who left his mark on the UK and entertainment scene many, many years ago. We're going to talk about his pop star days from the So Solid crew to his appearances on reality TV, his charity work, and much, much more. So, Harvey, he's done it all. Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure. That was a good, that was a good intro there. Do you know like that? Yeah, it was good. Powerful, powerful, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't take all the credit for the, tw for, for the, uh, for the 21 second thing. I, I, I hear it all the time, mate. All the time. All the time. So look, I mean, you and I were having a bit of a chat uh, before we came uh, before we came on camera, and uh, there's there's lots of different angles we can go down here. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this chat. But let's, I guess, let's rewind to the beginning and uh, how how did it all come about for you? You know, how how did you become a singer? I know you talked about a background in football. You know, did did, did you always envision envision this as a child? Not being a musician, no, because obviously my my mindset at the time I was I was a footballer. Um, I got scouted as a young man um, by Chelsea. You're talking 11, 12 years old. So there was music influence in my household. My dad was very, very talented, and but I, isn't, I didn't want to be a musician. It was always football, football, football. And you wanted to be a footballer. Yeah. So um, what, what about uh, and, and what was your uh, what was your background? I mean, did you have much money growing up, or you know, was it was it uh, you know, were you from the estates? I come off a council estate, bro, South London, um, Battersea. I come off the Dodderton estate, and then I moved further down the road where I met the rest of the boys, which is a place called Falcon Road the famous, notorious um, Win Stanley estate, which is which is well known for the wrong and right reasons. <laughs> but um, I come off the block, bro. But my dad was always a talented man. Um, my dad came from Jamaica. Um, he was in the Navy. My dad first moved to um, to Feltham. And then he ended up doing badness because my dad's um, no mystery. My dad was well known on the streets. <laughs> so just in all life, my mum ran ran the, the local youth club, Dodderton Youth Club in Battersea. So we was kind of a family about the community. My dad had like the respect on the streets. And my mum had the respect, just kind of what she'd done for the community. That's why my mum's, she's like a, my mum's like a queen in Battersea, just for what she's done for the youngsters. Does she still live there? My, well, she's just out of it now. She lives in Wimbledon. But um, she's a legend. My mum would never leave that area just by the way she's treated. And just, um, yeah, she's a voice for the community. Just the, just, just the, the amount of youngsters she's helped and, yeah, so we lived a quite a normal life, but it was it was council estate life, man. Were you a naughty boy? I was both. Yeah. Um, you, you know, one thing that my mum's friends always always would say was that I had manners. Because my dad, my mum and dad are old school. So yeah, I was, I was a naughty boy, but I always had manners to, uh, you know, respect your elders. I come from that foundation. I was never disrespectful, disrespectful to my older peers. So um, that stems from my mum. Like I said, my dad's Jamaican. My mum's, you know, half Welsh, um, Cardiff and... Sierra Leone, West Africa. So I had all the foundations. You know, when you when I used to go to my mum's dad's, my granddad, rest in peace, granddad, he was a strict African man. Um, yeah, you had to be on point. No form of disrespect. Yeah, it was his rules or, or hit the highway. And did you have brothers and sisters? That came later in life. So my, in terms of my mum, right. I'm my mum's only child. But then on my dad's side, when my dad remarried, I've got my two brothers and my sister. So, but I don't do all this, um, people say half, they're my brothers, my sister. Yeah. So tell me about football. It's in my DNA, man. But in in, in so far as um, you you got, you got scouted, you say when you were eleven or twelve. Yeah, so that that was playing. My mum didn't want me to go to school in South London, so she sent me to school in West London. So I went Pimlico because she didn't kind of want me to have the distraction of going to school with my friends. And a lot of my friends were bad, <laughs> and it would have been a distraction. So when I went to Pimlico, I ended up playing obviously playing for West London. Yeah, and that's when I got scouted for West London. And that stemmed from 
my, you know, my mum's um, partner who died five years ago, who's my hero, Sugar Ray, tattooed on my hands. He was a big, big influence in the community. Among, he was, a, you know, he was scouting for lots of clubs for Fulham, for Wimbledon. He was like the go-to guy to get players. And um, so much talent come from came from my area. Sean Davis, who played for Fulham. Clinton Morrison, who you see on Sky Sports News now, who played for Palace and Birmingham City. Myself. Um, so we had an influx of young talent, of young footballers. Clinton went Tottenham, Sean went Wimbledon, and I went Chelsea. So yeah, it was it was, it was a good time. But I, I always had the ability. I, I always knew that I would I would make you know have a decent living at, at football. And, and what became of your football career? I mean, how, how long did you play for, and how did that turn into music? Oh, well, it was a weird one. People don't realize I was actually still playing when I was in So Solid, and it oh, goes really? over people's well, heads. Playing professionally? Yeah, so not professionally. I, I semi professionally. That's when I re-signed for Wimbledon and Lewis. Yeah, so the level I've always played. I always played league, like when I first signed my pro contract, that was League Two. You probably know it then in our day as Division Three. Right. So Ray Clements was the first man to ever give me my first pro contract. When I got released for Barnet, I had all the top non-league clubs after me. So I went to Woking. And then where I had some of my best days was at Aldershot, which is you'd probably call now, um, which is one below um League Two. So I would I, I would always have maintained a good living at football, because them times I was on like you know, five, six hundred pounds a week. I was known in the game. So once I stopped playing, I broke my ankle, kind of got into the other side of life, going out on a Friday night, which I didn't know when I was a young man. You and we see you, bro you broke your ankle playing. Yeah. And 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 was that did that just put you out of the game temporarily or did that end, kind of end your professional career? It it was a weird one because I wouldn't say no, it didn't end my professional career because I came back fine, but it was a situation that at that time, a lot of my boys was, you know, playing in the championship, playing in the Premier League. And when I looked at the realism of my career, I'm only probably going to play like League Two or in the conference, which is now the National League. Um, and regardless, when I'm looking at the wage that I'm earning, because I'm a big dreamer and I aim high, I'm like, how am I going to be able to achieve what kind of all my goals on like, with no disrespect, five, six hundred quid a week? Um, you know, mortgages, cost of living now. <laughs> Um, like I said, there's so many things that I wanted to do in my life, but I knew I could maintain a good living at that level. But when I broke my ankle in training, um, I always had a musical talent of emceeing, but I went back to South London and everyone was kind of talking about Mega Man and Romeo. That's when So Solid first formed. And me and Romeo went to the same school. So he used to like MC in my local pub, which is just over the bridge from here. And he was a friend of yours? Yeah, we went to the same school. We went to the same school. So, um... What happened is when I was at Pimlico and I got to the third year, I got expelled for having a tear up, as you do. And then they, end up, they ended up sending me back to South London to go to school anyway. So my mum was like, great, now he's back with his mates. But she didn't want me to go to a school called Ernest Bevin because that's where most of the bad boys were. So she sent me to another school called Batsy Tech. And that's where Romeo went. Romeo was like the year younger than me. And as we got older and he started, he started to become popular with his MCA and he used to say to me, oh, come through to a local pub where he MCs, like, just come and, you know what I mean, do a set with me. And I was like, whatever, like, I'll turn up. And then when I got there, I was thinking, mate, this guy's got a massive following, like, in, in the local community. Started um, doing a few sets with him on a Friday. But when you said doing a few sets, what, I mean, you were rapping with him or? Yeah, he just, he just used to do sets, like, um, people, like he, like, he had a religious following of women. But presumably, you you must have known you you had some some ability or talent in there, so that, you know for, for him to have asked you in the first place. Of right? course, I knew I did, but I didn't. You got to think to yourself: there was no groups around that time. Please name a black successful group. It was always pop groups, or the only people I could probably relate to at that time would be Soul to Soul, Jazzy B, and yeah. But what was the template for going on to be a famous black musician until you seen us so solid? What was the template? There was nothing for me. Most of the Successful black artist was in America. Do you know what I mean? Rap had a culture in America. I didn't have a culture here. So I went, all right. I didn't think nothing of it. I didn't think I'd end up selling 8 million records and winning Brit Awards and MOBA Awards and, and being an iconic group. So yeah, it was bizarre. It was absolutely bizarre. So I done it. It was only on the underground at that stage, but Romeo was like, look, man, you're good. And I started to get popular with, you know, with people. And then obviously Mega Man and Romeo blew up and Mega Man formed so solid. And then... I remember when people kind of knew I was back in the area and I wasn't playing football to the level that I was, people and people started seeing me on a Friday night, which was bizarre, because Friday nights was usually, I got a game on a Saturday, pasta, <laughs> bottle of water, early night, going to war the next day with football. But then people started to see me in, like, like I said, bars on a Friday night. Juniors back around and 
girls MC in late nights, Mega Man form so solid. He asked me to go to a local radio station to um to test me out. Was there a record contract back at this point? No, no record right. contract. It was all that's what people don't understand about so solid. It was all organic. Do you think people from at that time, record labels was going to sign black boys off a council estate that they deemed as a threat in a stereotypical or how stereotypical it was back then and how racist the industry was. Um the people that believed in, believed in us was the guys that sitting next door. Jason Samuels, his dad, Albert and Dave Samuels, who was behind Atomic Kitten, Boy Zone. Don't really match up then thinking they're gonna sign so solid, does it? When you think of them kind of iconic pop groups. But um they they were the ones that got it. They signed Oxide and Neutrino first with the song Bound for the Reload. People don't realise they was actually the first people to be signed. We kind of merged with Oxide and Neutrino. And So Solid's impact on the underground was so big. Listen, we was getting 3,000 people. We was putting on our own raves. How the money was made, you don't need to be... <laughs> you don't need to, It's not rocket science, is it? There was... Selling a lot of water. Yeah, selling a lot of water. <laughs> That's the best way to put it, Matt. But um, we was putting on our own raves in um, Hammersmith, Vauxhall, Stratford, all over. And we was getting two and a half, three thousand people. Now you think when a signed act is doing auditoriums, that's what they're getting for through being signed. We was doing that on the streets. Three thousand people were turning up to see us. Who, who who was the business brain behind that? I mean, was there? I mean, was there a particular person who kind of ran the crew? You know, who, who put it all together and everyone else just yeah, turned up? Yeah, it'd be Mega and... at right. that time. It'd be Mega. Mega was the brains. He was the, he was the founder of So Solid, and he, he had that vision. So, um, I think uh, he went to jail as a young man for a stabbing or something. He went to jail for. But I think that was the biggest wake up call for him. He had this vision and this plan that he wanted to formulate this crew, and because he um. He kind of grew up in a home where he raised his 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 siblings. He wanted to create this kind of same thing, a bit similar to like how you look at like NWA or Wu Tang Clan. So solid's the same model. Yeah. It's a collective. It's organic. It's from the streets. It's music from the heart. It's music from struggle. And we're not going to conform to no one. There's no way. The good thing about So Solid, we're all strong characters. We're all as talented as each other in different ways, and we refuse to be controlled. Control who? Did did everyone want to do their own thing as well? You know, did everyone want to have a, a kind of a solo life as well as working for the crew? That came after success. Because with success breeds, how can I say, with success breeds problems. Yeah. Because Harvey and Romeo are getting offered all the deals or Ashley Waters, and that one's not getting offered a deal. So naturally with any group, as you've seen a million times, it causes tension between the members. You're young, you're getting loads of you getting, you know, you're getting ridiculous money thrown at you, which you're not used to. Um, money causes divide, doesn't it? I always say it's the root of all evil. Um, until you understand. Do you, th do, you th do you think it's hard for people in in bands? You know, when, when they're in a, a multi piece band, when I say to to know their place. I mean, I, I picked up on a comment you said mm. earlier when you were talking about the fact that you knew your career would would never would never be good enough in football to earn the kind of money you wanted. Yeah. Now, I mean, I, d I don't know if if you you can say that now looking back, or you know, I don't know if you were that honest with yourself at the time, you know, yeah. or if it's easier when when you look back, because I guess you know when we're when we're young and you know we're we're in in a band or in a football, mm. you know, we, we don't want to think that we're anything less less than the best, do we? Of course. And I think you know, you see a lot of a lot of people in bands who want to break off to do something solo, mm. but they should never be that solo person. You know, I don't, if, if you look at Boyzone, for example, you know, it's very clear that Ronan is only is going to only be the the, the right solo artist from yeah. that band, and, and and the other people the other people shouldn't be going on their own. And it's not a bad thing. It just it just it just yeah, is what is what it is. And I think you know, if you if you know your place, I guess it's like. I'm trying to think of an analogy. It's like like people who say, "I want to own my own business because yeah. I want to go go and make all the money." But you know, some you know some people. I say some people. Most people shouldn't be business owners That's in right. the same way that most people shouldn't be solo artists. That's correct. Um, and you know, you can people can make a lot more money by riding passenger in somebody else's car yeah. than, than than being the drive themselves. But you've got to have that self awareness and that honesty to know that it's it's not crushing your ego. That's right. Uh, you know, I'm just I'm just a better number two, but I'm going to make a fuck ton of money as a number yeah, two yeah, yeah. instead of. Fucking it up as a number Nine one. Nine-year-old. Nine-year-old. Um, that's actually a good um, analogy, as you'd say, because in So Solid, um, you've got some people, like I said, you know, some are real leaders. Um, some are happy just to go along. But there was a lot more leaders in So Solid, because when you look at Harvey, Ashley Waters, Romeo, and Mega Man, and Lisa Mafia, we're all bosses, bosses in our own right. 
And I think the biggest mistake that we all made, because me and Romeo and Lisa and Ashley Waters went solo after the first album. And I, I think that we, we should have done the second album as so solid as the original members. That's why the second album didn't do so well because half of us wasn't on it. You know, the record label. Were you on it or nah, not? Oh, because none. you, oh, you, you didn't do so. so solid. People didn't know this so solid. Um, Mega was trying to bring more artists through, but people didn't want to see these artists. They wanted to see Mega Man, Romeo's, Harvey, the original members that made that, uh, you know, that first album iconic. But record labels, naturally, record labels, they're going to cause divide because when the first album come out, you know, you got Universal, Polydor come for me for a quarter of a million, Romeo getting offered a deal for a quarter of a million, Lisa getting offered a deal, Ashley Waters, it's naturally going to cause divide because when you're looking at that type of money as an individual, everyone's got different mindsets and different plans. You're thinking of how you can better your life, better your family, better your, you know, you know, um, your, your lifestyle. And um, you're not really thinking with your head and logic at that time because you're young. And when someone's f flashing a check like that, it's going to cause problems and divide. And I always say that after that first album, there was so much internal issues anyway. How many people were in the band at the peak? At the, if you're talking about the artists, that, are, that are, is what you see on 21 Seconds, so you'd say about nine artists. But if you're looking at the whole collective, we formed, we had our own record label. We had our own DJs. We had, so you're looking at the whole organisation, you're looking at probably to 30, to 40, 30 to 40 people. And how did the money split? Like just divided by 30 or do some people get more you than don't others? Do you know what? This is a question that people always ask. So when any artist that was getting their solo deals, you just pay your 20% commission to your to your agent. No, so Solid have no say within that. But anything that was made within So Solid, of course, there were splits. But in terms of the album, it wasn't like an even split. It was kind of the work that you done. So prime example, on the first album, Ashley Waters was on most of the tracks. It was like we sat in a meeting and it was like, listen, we're going to make a number of songs and then we're all going to sit down in a room around the table, which we did. And we're going to choose which are the best songs to go in this album. So that created um, a competitive nature anyway. I was on three songs in the album. Ashley Waters was on like about 11. So naturally, he, you kind of get paid for the songs that you're on. It wasn't like um, you get the money and you do it even split. It's a bit like football. If you make the yep. team, you're good. And if you don't, yep. <laughs> then you're going you're to suffer. But um, yeah, it, it was... Um, and also you had the popular members. So when you're doing shows... You, the artist would get paid who's getting booked. It's that simple. If you're not getting booked, mate, you're not getting paid. It is that real. And at that time, you know, it was like the Harvey, a Romeo, a Lisa Mafia was very popular um, within the scene. So, yeah, um, on a financial level in terms of shows, yeah, yeah, I, you know, we, we done well. But I wasn't happy, man. I remember, like, if, when I left So Solid right after the first album, we all signed our solo deals. I was happy to get away, to be honest with you, because there was internal fallouts. I didn't want to be in the group, Matt. There was too much at that time, too much stress. There was stress on the streets. There was stress in the industry. It, it was probably the most unhappy I've ever been. And, I mean, we, we talk nowadays a lot about, about mental health and depression, mm. which probably wasn't talked about, well, certainly wasn't talked about as much back then, but I guess it's also not the kind of topic uh, that you would expect to be Correct. on the tip of the tongue of, you know, of nine, nine, nine gangsters in a, in, yeah. in, a, in a band from the streets. I mean, it, how, how was mental health back then for everybody else? Well, this is so weird because my fiancé, my rock, is a mental health nurse. Imagine that. And she's one of the top mental health nurses. And she said something to me the other day, like literally four weeks ago. And um, she went, we was watching a documentary on telly. And she went, you've got, you've got PTSD, you know that. And I said, I agree with you. Because um, So Solid was enough. And obviously not just So Solid, because yeah, it's a big part of my life, but I also had my own life. Things that I've seen at home, things that I went through with family members, things that I went through with friends. And it's caused trauma, you know? In So Solid, I got stabbed in my neck at 20 years old. I've had some real devil people around me. I've been around. Music is a gangster. I always say music is a gangster business and it's a devilistic business. You get all these fake people around you. I always say that no one in music is your friends, mate. People are only using you for what you can give them at that time. And then dealing with family stress, um, music stress, stress of the streets, getting death threats. Remember, I don't. I, I wasn't born in a rose garden. I wasn't born in Windsor of a well-to-do family. I come from the streets, my brother. Um, so when you're successful, the streets follow you. So naturally, for your mind at that time, 
that's why, with no disrespect, but I look at some of the things that people moan about now and I'm like, you're moaning about that. If you was in my era, you would have crumbled. You would have crumbled. The things that I've had to deal with, deal with. Where should we start? Should we start with home life? What I've seen go on between, you know, what my mum and dad. Should I start about So Solid, the trauma within So Solid? Should I, my own trauma, what I've been through with women and divorces and... I, I, mate, there's boxes. You can go in each corner and I can pick out stress from each corner. But obviously I'll say my mental health wouldn't have been good. But I refused, I refused to crumble for anyone. I ain't crumbling for no one. I ain't, with no disrespect, I'm not killing myself for no one. That's down to the big man upstairs. When he decides when I'm meant to go. Um, I'm not going to let society crush me like that. Even though, I'll tell you something right now, Matt, I've been in some dark holes, my bro. Some real dark holes. I've done it all. Been jail. There's nothing I ain't experienced in my life. And have you, have you ever taken any professional help for um, for mental health? Have you, you talked to counsellors, psychologists? It's weird when they say when people say professional help. I had a guy called um called the Ras. He's like a raster from Battersea. Legend. Legend, man. One of the most positive guys that I, you, you, I can't describe in words. Between him and my stepfather, that's what all I needed. They was my guiding light. I didn't need to go and sit in a professional room. Because they were prophets anyway. And they're the ones that always just say to me, don't worry about what people think of you. Just keep going. Everything you do, do it with a good heart. As long as your heart's good, your karma will always be good. It will always work out. And they would give me the advice that I needed, especially when I was in dark places. Do you know what I mean? And um, yeah, that's what I needed. I've sat down, when I presented T4 back in the day, I sat down with a psychologist, same, um, same psychologist that used to do like Cat Dealey and Princess Diana. Um, but that was more kind of teaching me how to, if I'm presenting national telly, they're kind of trying to show me that you can't carry the streets onto national TV. You've got to be accessible to people. So when you're on t presenting national telly, you can't be like, oh, I'm cool. Because you're not, you're not just appealing to the people in South London, you're appealing to people like up north from where you're from. Someone in a house in Scumthorpe, someone in a house in Scotland. And it was kind of making me, it was kind of just showing me to be relaxed, sorry, comfortable in my own skin, which I am now, because I know who I am. I don't need people to certify who I am. I don't need to act hard for you to know who I am. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I, I, it's, it's, it's proven. You know my CV. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned a minute ago about, about death threats um, mm. um, during the So Solo Crew days. I mean, pr presumably they weren't for singing a note out of tune um, <laughs> yeah. and it's uh, for, for things that were going on out, outside the music. I mean, how, how, how naughty were, were the crew? You know, I mean, how, how was, was a lot going on other than, other than singing a melody? No one, in the, no one in So Solid is mugs, bro. I can actually say not one person. Um, the streets follow you. But, no. but did people, because I guess you, you hear a lot about people obviously knowing the surroundings and wanting, you know, wanting to climb out of the streets yeah. or make a better life for themselves. But then, you, you know, you also see, and again, as a bystander, I don't know how much is true or isn't, but, you know, you, you see so many stories of famous artists who obviously have clearly come from bad backgrounds, made made good money or made massive money mm. and performing, but they're still, you know, they're still up to no good. You know, yeah. w w whether it's as, I say, minor, I don't know, whether it's as minor as, you know, being caught with a firearm or yeah, something, yeah. or whether they're still killing, dealing, you know, wh whatever yeah. they're doing. I mean, wh why why does that still go on? You know, if, if you wanted, if someone wanted to build a career in music to get out of that street life, you yeah. know, what, why, why are they still in it? That's what I don't respect, exactly what you just said. If you get given the opportunity to get out of that life and live a good life, it always confuses me, the artists that go back and dabble with the same things that cause them problems and cause them negativity. And if I could be quite honest with you, maybe in the... Uh, with So Solid, none of the boys was like that because if you speak to like a, 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 a Mega or a Ashley Waters or a Romeo, we don't respect bad boys, bro. And my boys were bad. We don't respect it because we... What we done was for a purpose. It was like, I'd always say, none of the boys in, in the crew were troublemakers. We were always defending ourselves or someone bringing it to us and then it gets dealt with. But I always say that, particularly the new artists right now, Matt, I'm going, hold on a minute. Some of them are like, you've got a record deal. You've sold, I don't know, at, at the time, half a million, a million records. And then two years down the line, you're getting nicked for like, I don't know, still being active with drugs. And I'm like, so you must enjoy it. You must enjoy it because as soon as I got the opportunity and the check to get out of it and be, live a clear life, I never looked back. 
I never looked back. Yeah, you'd make, you'd make basic mistakes. Of course you would, because you're human. But I didn't ever think to myself, right, let me go back and yeah. fuck with the streets. Now that I'm legal, legit, and I'm look, I'm earning money that I don't have to look over my shoulder. So I can't really relate to that because any of the boys that got an opportunity to get out of it, they just went forward. It was actually more people trying to bring us down, Matt. Jealousy. I was going to say, envy. You, pe pe people yeah, have not made it. more jealousy, and... envy, because, you know, you, you, you know, you go back to, I've seen it, you go back to community sometime and you can see the, see the envy in people's eyes. Do you know what I mean? You know, for the fact that you've got out. But I don't give a shit about these people because I worked extremely hard for it. And maybe if you got up off your ass and put your life and soul into it and you dedicated yourself and you, you applied yourself to your craft, you would have got out of it. So I feel no form of guilt mm. for my own success because it didn't get given to me, Matt. I worked my ass off. And literally, I can use the, the term blood, sweat, and tears. I can use that because that is my career. That's what it symbolizes. Don't just throw it out there, oh, your blood, sweat, and tears. Blood stabbed in my neck. Sweat, sweated for every moment. Tears. Some of the things that I've had done to me by friends, family members, the streets. Blood, sweat, and tears, my man. Literally. And I'm still standing. Still standing. You've got to kill me to stop me, my guy. I mean, one one of your bandmates. I'm going. Was it Ash, Ashley that? Yeah. He, he was the one that went to went to jail. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, talk talk to me a bit about that. I mean, how how did that affect you guys at the time? And I guess, and also, you know, t talking about what we just talked about. You know, once you step out of the life, and I mean, mm. I know, like you say, you, you'll always be from the streets, so mm. you, you'll always have, you'll always behave in a certain way. Um, but I mean, I, I would assume, you know, someone who who didn't come from the streets wouldn't be wouldn't be shooting, uh, you know, shooting a guy over a, a you know, a, a, let's say a, a Mr. and Mrs. dispute. That's uh, correct. You know, um, I mean, you know, does he? I mean, do you guys still keep in touch? You yeah. Know, and and he presumably very much regrets that now or, or or was it just you just can't get your head out of that life at the time no because even with Ashley Ashley's younger than me do you know I was with him that day so what's bizarre is when he got caught with a gun with the traffic warden me and him was doing a press day I think for 21 seconds and I went in a, I got in a chauffeur car by the label to go home and then I got home and by six next thing I see him on the six o'clock news I was like what the fuck has happened no Ashley and I'll tell you this first and foremost Ashley never had any intentions to ever kill anyone or do any of these things. He wasn't from Clapham Junction. Ashley Waters and Lisa Matthew and Trino, they was actually recruited into So Solid. So Ashley actually lived in Camberwell, Peckham. But he, he was having a lot of drama on the streets, like people threatening his life. And because he's a, the mother of his child at the time, she lived in Brixton. So Brixton was like enemy lines to us at the time because Brixton and Clapham Junction don't get on. And he had an incident with a couple of lads. They kind of rolled up on him when he was with his kid. And I, um, they threw like a pavement slab through his sunroof with his two-year-old kid in the back. Now, I remember when he called me. I'll never, ever forget this. He called me on the phone. He was like sobbing down my phone. Like, what the fuck? And I was like, what? They done what? Now, naturally, you're going to protect your family by any means necessary. And when we kind of got into that life, rap, there was nothing that we couldn't get. Ashley made a bad decision getting the firearms. I call it a bad decision. He didn't mean it. He didn't have intent in it. But it's kind of thing when, when someone's threatening your life and your family and your two-year-old son's in the back of your car, I think he had a moment of panic. So he thought, fuck it. I'm going to get a gun. Because people are threatening my life and my family out of my, my, out of my success. And also I got to look at him at the time. He was 19 years old. Now look at the geezer. He's got the number one show on Netflix. He's, that's all behind him. He's a family man. So... I think you've got to understand the mindset of what he was going through. It was a bad decision, but we all made bad decisions in So Solid, Matt. I had a gun, Matt. Are we, are we... Stupid, 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 most stupidest thing I've ever done. And do you want to hear the joke? Yeah. I got a gun <laughs> and I rang my mum and told her. <laughs> like, who does that? Who does... My mum was like, she went ballistic. She then rang my dad and she's not even with my dad. My dad's like, what are you going to do with that? But my mindset was a time was like, I've had enough, dad. People are threatening me. Um, I'm also picking up my own enemies through my success. And I'm also picking up a lot of the boys' enemies. Because some of the boys, before So Solid, was active on the streets. I wasn't active on the streets like that because I was playing football. But some of my boys was very, very active. So you, your enemies follow you. So I remember like being out and just getting approached by people 
just because I'm affiliated to So Solid creates paranoia. I've had knives backed out on me. I remember one time I went to Blockbuster Video to go and get a video. And these lads come up to me and he's a back the butterfly out of me. Luckily, I'm handy. And I've done what I had to do with my, with my hands. Do you know what I mean? But it, 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 it created fear. Even in that, that moment of me having a firearms at that time, I was thinking I could have fucked my whole life up. Imagine I got pulled over by a police or I could have been looking at, you know, seven years in jail. And I never forget, I rang my dad. And my dad sent his mate down. He's a very, very serious man who I can't name. <laughs> um, who loved me. He went ballistic. I'll never forget the exact words he come, he said to me. He drove and met me on the side street. He said, give me that now. And he, he held it and he said, do you know what this does to people's lives? He says, you want to you live the life I live? You know what I mean? And he's done things. And um, he went fucking ballistic. And he went, you're protected, young Harvey. No one can hurt you. Like, anyone fucks with you, we, we deal with that shit for you. Don't you dare carry one of them things ever again. Da -da -da. Fucking, I was shitting myself. He's a lunatic too. He took it off me and gave me 1,500 quid and drove off. <laughs> and that's the only time. God's honour, man, I've ever, ever had a gun, had a gun, man. A gun for two days of my, of my whole 44 years on this earth. And that was it. And it was just, I look back at it now and it's the most stupidest thing I've ever, ever done ever done like so stupid what was I going to do with that kill someone but that's because we was paranoid Matt our, we, our families was getting threatened we was getting threatened it just created paranoia and you got to think to yourself in them days yeah there wasn't a lot of cameras about mate like how it is now you know I say to, I say to these like these young boys they're mental like go and do a murder mate you're going to get caught within two days because like there's <laughs> fucking cameras everywhere it's like big brother in the real world now you know, you scan your phone, you do this. They're tracking everything you're doing. So in my day, they probably would have killed me and no one would have, would have found me for about a month. <laughs> I'd have been all decomposed with all maggots coming out of me and all sorts. So, But yeah, it, nah, I, I, I'm never ever going to put that in any of the boys because none of the boys ever, ever wanted to carry firearms by Tris. Did I uh, did I get the name of the guy? Because I said Ashton when you mentioned the traffic warden, but I was referring to somebody who um, who shot his ex girlfriend's boyfriend. Uh, oh. So yeah, so you're talking about um, Carl Morgan who's doing life. Yes. Yeah, Morgan. Yeah, that's that's sad. Um, it's sad because Morgan Morgan was um, a producer. I went to visit him. Funny enough, for the first time after I seen him after doing after he's done thirteen years. And it was heartbreaking, man. He was in the crew at the time. He was, he was a producer. He was a producer, um, Morgs. Um, and it's weird, I've grown up with him. It That was, I'll never forget that day. I was about two weeks away from getting married. And I was in a restaurant in St. Albans. You know, my whole life, so I'm now Harvey, the celebrity. And I'm sitting at the time with my wife-to-be and having a family meal. And then someone's like, message me. Um, Morgan's been arrested for doing this. And I'm just like, it, I couldn't even describe it because I've grown up with him. I know him. I'm like, I would never have had Carl in that position to say that he would, he would do that. And um, yeah, it was just, it was heartbreaking more than anything. Cause I know the real him. And as bizarre as may people, as bizarre as people may think this is, because I always say at the same time, there's a, a young man that's not here anymore due to the situation. I'm I'm baffled. I'm I'm baffled that he, that he would do something like that. And then when I visited him in jail after 13 years, he's re, he's re, um rehabilitated. Oh, that's he's, the first he's, he's re, time in 13 years you've seen. Yeah, that. it was sad because he's helped so many people in in jail for what he's done, and it's yeah, it's heartbreaking. Because he's, he's not that type of person. How did he get in that situation? Was it was he? A, I mean, was it his gun? Was he a naughty boy back then as well? Or just Morgan? Was, Morgan, no. And, and I'm never ever gonna. That's what I say about life. But see, stories and media—they're the worst things you can ever rely on with people because they give out the wrong image. Now, if I could say I grew up with a guy that was a nasty piece of work and he was always gonna go that way, and then he ended up doing that, then I'd be like, "Yep, yeah, Matt. You know what? He was always gonna go that way." But he was the same. He came from like, he, you know, he was like. A, a, a good guy looked after his brothers and sisters. He was a guy that always made me laugh. Wasn't a horrible person. Didn't hurt people. And I just think that in life, you, you got to live by your decisions. And I just think it was a horrible situation that it, that it had to end like that. You know, I think when I found out, I was more shocked. Morgan killed someone. What? 
It's a bit like when someone hearing that you killed someone, but they know you as Matt. Like, Matt ain't got that in him. Matt wouldn't do that. It was more mind-boggling. It'd be different if someone was a born killer. Then it'd be different. Then I'd be like, well, he was always going to go that way because he was a horrible, nasty piece of work. Nah, Carl wasn't that. He wasn't that at all. Bizarre. More confusion. And it was more confusing when I went to see him. And he's so, like, remorseful for what he did. And he said to me, i never forget it. I didn't know what to say to him apart from, like, I'm just glad you're well. And, you know, because he's, he's got a long time to do in there. When's he getting out? Oh, gosh, man. I think he's done about 15, 16 years now. I think I probably won't see him till he's like 60 odd. Yeah. It's sad. And um, I spoke to him because we get calls from him now and again in jail. And it was nice. We was at a photo shoot about six months ago. And what's nice is the phone goes around to all of us. So like, Morgan's on the phone. Morgan's on the... And we just try and keep his spirits up, you know? But there's not, I can't say to him, um, things are going to be okay or... Um, see you soon. So the conversations yeah. is quite generic. You just try and keep him positive. I can't even relate to being in jail for that amount of time. He went in there, I think, when he was 20, 20 years old. So it's more bizarre. And it's, like I said, it's more heartbreaking. It's more heartbreaking. And yeah, man, them, like I said, when you make decisions like that in life, I guess you've got to live by them, as they say, didn't they? So mm. I can't defend the situation. So people be like, how can you defend that? You know, someone died out of it. But um, the man that the man that I know, he was never that. He was never that guy. He was never a horrible, spiteful, vindictive man. I just think it was a very dark situation where he made a terrible decision. And um, yeah, he's now he's paying the price for it right now. So one of the things I just try, I try not to um, I try to remember the good things of him. Sure. Do you know what I mean, Matt? If I focus on that, I'm gonna be like. It's just negative. It's negative. And um, but I hope one day um I can just have one beer with him, even if it's when he's 60, 65. I hope he just, you know, gets to have a bit of a life. Because he's 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 serving his time and he he's still serving it and he's got a long way to go, unfortunately. Well, I was gonna say, let's talk a bit about life after music but but you still do music now so I, I guess um uh, when when did things tail off for you to tail off with with your with the band and, and your solo career initially and, and and what happened for you after that was would you say like yeah music's a part of my dna but it's not my it's not my um how can i put it it's not my priority as it used to be because obviously i've set up a life for myself i've got a sports agency now i look after to football players, um, I mean, so I, 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 yeah. I guess, I guess, time wise, I, I mean, I'm talking more back to, I don't, let's say, the mid to late 2000s. Yeah, sorry. So yeah. when I left So Solid, so yeah, when I um, when I left So Solid and I went into like, you know, my solo stuff with Universal, that was a good journey. But how, how many albums did you do? Done. I didn't even bring out. I didn't even get to an album, funny enough, because the label went bust. Oh really? So I brought out a single, and then um, Romeo brought out, out his album. I think Lisa brought out hers, but that was probably 2004, 2005. But what, as I brought out that single, I went and done an interview on T4 to promote my single. And that's where my life changed because I had like, you know, T Channel 4 producers like, this guy's charismatic, he's fun, he's a good laugh. Then they obviously gave me a presenting job on T4. And that's when my whole life changed. That's when I became like, yeah, Harvey the celebrity. And that was it. So. I kind of probably, yeah, after, I probably spent about a year in my solo deal, to be honest with you. Still doing shows, because so solid, we always, we always do shows, you know? That first album, you could live, live off it for the rest of your life, is, is iconic. That They Don't Know album. So we're still doing shows and touring the world. But yeah, the presenting changed my life. That kind of brought me to the masses. That's when probably people like you started to know more about me. People started to see my character. I, I, I didn't become a threat then. Oh, he's actually a fun guy. Oh, he's, he's, he's normal. Because I'd walk into a building and people think I'm going to shoot them. And what, what, which what, is ridiculous. What were some of what were some of your best uh, best jobs back then in terms of presenting? What, what what gigs did you get? Oh my god, where do we start, man? Um, I've done it all. I interviewed Jackie Chan, Spike Lee, Jennifer <laughs> Lopez, How Berry. Like, I've done the VMAs. Um, presented awards at the Mobos. Too many opportunities. I had, you know. I had my own show on Trouble TV. Like, I've lived a life, man. Like Trouble TV. I remember. Yeah, that. do you remember that? 
Yeah, I'm trying to think what was on it. Was that what Sweet Valley High was on? That's right. That's I correct. Fucking love Bloody Sweet Valley hell. High. Fuck <laughs> my life. Sweet Valley High. <laughs> this, this classic program. We used to race home like, from yeah, school oh for that. Oh my God. Then you remember the great, obviously, we could go way back. We could go Saved by the Bell if you want to yeah. go deeper. Yeah. And Screech and all that. But um, yeah, that's when it changed, man. And, and even around that time, that's when I shot my first film with Steven Seagal, Out for a Kill. So that, that was a weird day too because... Tell me about it. So what, what was that? I didn't know about that. I was on the way to the, I was on the, way to the Mobile Awards. No, sorry. It was the week of the Mobile Awards. It was the year after we won it and I was presenting an award to Miss Dynamite. And at the time, my father's managing me and he's like, she had a call from Jeremy Zimmerman. And I'm like, the big casting director, Jeremy Zimmerman, he's like casting Batman and things like that. And even films way, way before that. I said, yeah, he wants you to come in for a reading for a Steven Seagal film. I'm like, what the hell? So this is a joke. I went in, done the reading, and then the next day, my dad's like, you've got the, you've got it. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you have to fly to Bulgaria straight after the Mobile Awards. And then since that day, me and Stephen Skull has been friends ever since. Are you, you still know him today? Hi, like, man. What, 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 I, what's, he, what's he like? I mean, as a kid, I yeah. was a massive, massive Seagal fan. I know yeah. you, you always think, it, as a, let's say, as a bystander, it's, yeah. it's sad. I mean, everyone gets old, don't they? But it's sad how different he looks now. You know, yeah, come, yeah, I mean, course. he was, you know, not only did he have all the moves and stuff back then, but he, he was so thin and good looking. Yeah, and, man, he's and, the man. And he just, for, for a bystander, he kind of looks like he's got old and weird, you know, but yeah. he, is he, what's nah, he like? He's the man. I spent, I'm I mean, I'm Googling this movie to see which one it is because yeah. I've, I've seen it yeah, out, out for, for a, a kill. kill. I've yeah. seen every Seagal movie about so he's 10 put, times. He's put Michael Harvey out for a kill. I tell you, last night I watched, um, uh, I love a bit of old stuff, so I downloaded a 1990 Jean Claude Van Damme one last night, which was uh, 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 Death Warrant. Oh, come on, man. You're talking all my classic films, bro. <laughs> I, was, I, I got up early to go to the gym this morning. It was where two, two tired to go. I had to go? finish it. Do you want to go Blood Sport? Do you want to go Kickboxer? <laughs> Do you want to go Death Warrant? What's the one? Double Impact? Wait, double I, Impact. I love like, Double Impact. Come on, man. We're showing our age now, aren't we, Matt? Definitely. These are all films I grew up on. But yeah, Stevens, Stevens a great man. He's a great man. Just looking for the box to see if I recognise it. I can't, is it a box with him? What's on the box? He's holding a gun That's like right. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we shot it in Bulgaria. And, what, um, what was your part? What did you do? I, me and him, so I just spent, I got caught on like the Kazakhstan border and then me and him was in jail together. Um, he got framed because he's like a doctor. Um, you know Steven Seagal films, you know the narrative, man. He's going to come <laughs> back and get revenge on some fucker. <laughs> and then me and him spent um, time in jail in the scene and then once he, once he got out of the jail, then my role was done. But that was like my first ever acting role. And we just became friends ever since. And then I spent time with him in Bulgaria. And then I, I flew to LA. I was presenting T4 in LA and that's when I went to his house. And then me and him went out for dinner. And that was my, the, like one of the most crazy nights because we get in a car at the time, like a kind of... I wouldn't say it was because G-Wagons wasn't out then, but it was like a, a Mercedes Jeep. And as we were leaving the house, he's looked after by LAPD. So I knew the, the guy that looks after him because I knew him from when we shot in Bulgaria. That's like the guy, his bodyguard. And um, the, guy's, the guy looks at me and he's kind of like, his wife goes to him, you sure it's safe for you to go out? And I'm thinking, what the fuck's safe? What are you going on about? Like, and then we're walking out the door in his big house in, in the Hollywood Hills. And I'm getting in the car, he's like, he calls me Michael. He goes, I'm just going to take Michael for dinner. And then his LAPD guy's like, oh, fucking hell. And he's like, strapped that gun in his waist. And I'm like, fuck, I'm just going <laughs> to... And then I'm like, then I clocked, obviously. He, he had the, um, he had a contract on him, didn't he? From the Italian family. Oh, I remember reading that, about it at the right. time. And, um, and obviously, like, they've got a contract on him. And, but he, he, Steven Skull, don't fear no one. And he's well protected too. I think he had like, he's protected like by triads and all that. So... So then we get in this car and we restaurant. Obviously, I'm thinking, great, I'm getting in the car with Steven Skull and he's got a contract on him and I'm in this car. <laughs> this is fucking brilliant. And then we get in the car and um, we're in a bomb-proof car, mate. The car's bomb-proof. We went, for, we went for dinner in LA. We had a cracking night. But I just remember, like, when we got out of the car, man, his security guy was just so on point. He had all these guys, you know, they're checking the car and getting out and what's around in here. And we're going in the back way of the restaurant. I'm thinking, fuck my life. That was my luck. <laughs> um, and we had a cracking night. But... um. I got love for the guy, man. He he just showed me like he's a spiritual man. I remember sitting in his house in LA, and there's like a Chinese woman with a briefcase, and she like opens a briefcase, and he's just got like wads of cash. He's just giving her like wads of like, wads of cash, and she's like taking this cash and then she's closing the briefcase. And you know what it was in the briefcase? It was spiritual beads. It's just beads. They have all different meanings and. 
thing. So she was the woman that you know sold him the, these beads and he used to wrap them around his hands and this bead, bead means peace and this one means whatever it is. Well, you always see him do that in the movies, yeah, don't you? Yeah, yeah. He's a deep guy, man. I mean, I can't, some of the conversations, I remember being in a hotel, the Sheraton Hotel in Bulgaria with him and me and him, he was playing a guitar because he loves his reggae. And he put me on the phone to Marcia Griffiths, the reggae singer, because that's his good friend. And if you're a Jamaican boy, Marcia Griffiths is massive in your household. She's like a Jamaican singer. And he was friends with her. And then one night, like, he was making me, like, in the hotel, he's making me, like, recite lines of his, one of his films. Because I said to him, you know one of my, I said to him, Stephen, you know one of my favourite films of yours is Mark for Death. Remember Mark for Death when he goes, when he has a battle against, oh, Mark the, for the, yeah, 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 battle yeah. against the Yardies. And it was hilarious. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's where there was the, um, um, Screwface, the voodoo. Yes, the, the voodoo, voodoo guy. Yeah, but there was actually two of them. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, he shot so many films. He's like, he's going to me, fuck me, Michael, man. I forgot some of the lines from it. Do you remember them? Because do we remember them? I goes, in South London, that was, them, that film was <laughs> fucking massive. And um, he made me recite some of the lines to him and like, he's crying to his stomach because he forgot some of them. And I remember saying to him, um, there's a line when um, the guy goes to him, um, do you remember the, the scene when the guy jumps out the window? Was skew- so Steven Seagal, because Steven Seagal's character in Mark for Death is called Hatcher, the copper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he catches one of the, like, the yardies in the, in the room. But the guy basically says to him, Screwface would give me a hundred more debts worse than yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So find him your fucking self and jumps out the window. Yeah, I do remember. Because he's so loyal to his boss that he'd rather kill himself than Steven Seagal nick him. <laughs> and I kept saying that line to Steven Seagal and I remember he was in the room like, like rolling. He's like, I remember that line. I remember how many takes we done. And I thinking, shit, this guy's shot me so many films. He doesn't even remember his own lines or, or some of the scenes. And um, yeah, he's a good man, man. I've got so much love for Steven, man. Did he teach you any fight moves? No, nah, but I watched it live. I watched it. He was a bit older then when we done Out for a Kill. Wasn't as mobile as he used to be. But um, I remember why he respected me because he tried to intimidate me at first, but he does it on purpose. So what he's done is he's walked to my trailer to meet me and he's got all like this massive entourage with him. And then the director or one of the runners has said, um, oh, hi, Steven, this is Michael. He'll be playing blah, blah. And he's kind of like, like size me up. And at the time, I got, funny enough, I got a prison outfit on. I got my outfit on that I'm going to shoot on set. And he's kind of like sized me up like this. And he went, like looking at me, and I'm thinking, fuck my life, this is Steven Seagal. And he went to me, are you the rapper? So I went, I don't really know how to answer this. And I went, so I, just, I literally went like this, I went, yeah? And he went, well, I don't want you to be a fucking rapper. And I kind of looked at him like, and I went, well, I'm not here to be a fucking rapper. And then me and him just had to stare out for about two minutes. I'm thinking, fuck, I'm done. <laughs> like, he's going to sack me. I don't know what the fuck. And he looked at me like this and he went, I like you. And walked off. And I'm going, <laughs> but we shot the scene. Me and him had a right laugh. And then um, he says, come in my trailer and they have some food. And he had all this like fucking Japanese food and all this. And we just sat in the trailer eating food and we never said a word to each other. And then during the night, when we was back at the hotel, having, a, having like a crew party and a laugh, he went to me, he went to me I like you. When you're comfortable in your own skin. And I said, mate, with the greatest respect, you're a legend, but I don't get intimidated by people. I don't give a fuck who you are, man. So I said, if he's comfortable just eating food and not talking, I'm not going to talk. I'm not just going to talk for the sake of talking. And yeah, he, I think he just respected the way I moved because he knew I was real. You know what I mean? I wasn't in awe of him. I respected him. Mr. Steven Scott is my childhood. I did have little visions in my head of being in a fucking mirror going like that oh, when I was a kid, <laughs> but I'm not going to show that to him. To me, like, you're just a human being. You know what I mean? So that's simple. I just, I, I'm desperate to learn that move, you know, where he, uh, he does in every film where he just somehow grabs a hand somehow and it yeah. doesn't, doesn't matter how big or strong they are. It's like, it's like three fingers and he's yeah, got them literally, got them moving literally around. A notorious Steven Seagal move. <laughs> Wait, is it, I'll be like, is it pressure points? How are they doing this? But who fucking knows, eh? Well, I don't feel I don't feel we can follow up uh, Steven Seagal by talking about Big Brother. Oh, fucking <laughs> yeah. I, feel, I feel like we're giving a big big insult to Steven. Uh, but uh, yeah, 2012, you did um, Celebrity Big Brother. Mm. How how did that come about? I mean, did did you, did you have any particular motivation or goal for going in other than it was just work, or did did you fancy the experience? No, nah, but do you know what it was? I was obviously naturally I was being the usual shit. I, I, do you know what? To be honest with you, I'm bored of talking about it. Not Big Brother, but the usual shit. The good old papers, 
some form of bullshit to, talking about me to do with women, trying to execute me in some form of way they always had. You know, try to always make out I'm this like womanizing, love rat, whatever the fuck they want to call me. Um, and then at the time, I also had a, he a, he a heavy tax bill. And um, they approached me once before, but it kind of never went through. And then my profile went up the year after because I was in the papers again for women's shit. Because you know how this, work, this world works? It's, 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 when Big Brother comes for you, they don't come for you all the time like, oh, you're doing so well in life. They play off negativity and they play off profile, don't they? And I think they, they thought I was going to go in there and be this like womanizing gangster rapper as they always paint this picture of so solid members. And then Jason, who's next door, my agent, I, I remember he come up to me once and I said, Jason, I'm because yeah, I'm, I'm very stubborn. I'm like, I don't need to go on TV to prove to people who I am. I know who the fuck I am. And as long as my family know who I am, fuck the public. It's that simple. I ain't here to prove myself to the public. Do you know what I mean? And then he came back with a check and the price. And I thought, fuck my life. Only a stupid man would turn this down. And I did have a heavy, a heavy tax bill too. So if I could be honest with you, I've done it for the money. That's the honest truth. I didn't do it because I wanted to, particularly wanted to go and sit with Big Brother and wear fucking stupid outfits and thing. But you know what? I had a crack in time. Uh, but when you knew you were going in, I mean, as much as you say you don't give a fuck what anyone thinks, mm. did you I mean, did you think it would be a nice chance to show the real side of Harvey that, you know, that people don't get to see? I wouldn't or... say I thought like that, but I knew that... It would happen anyway. I knew it would happen anyway. Because I know who I am. I'm listen, bro. I'm loved in my community. You know what I mean? I'm loved amongst, amongst my real people. You know what I'm saying? So... It was just like, a lot of my friends that watched it was like, you don't need to tell me he's a good person because that's who he is. So when people see me like, when people's like, oh, he's a real compassionate guy and he's really honest. See me, I own my mistakes, bro. I don't hide from them. I don't hide from my mistakes, man. You know what I mean? So when people see me very honest and when people was asking me questions within the house and I was answering them openly, it kind of set up a positive path for me. When I, went, when I went in, walked into the house, usual, girls are screaming, and then you're hearing, boo, boo, boo. you know, fake, fickle Britain, judgmental Britain. Um, and when I came out, people was cheering for me. And I was like, sums up, sums up our country. Do you know what I mean? Sums it up, you know? Oh, now you like me now? <laughs> Didn't really give a fuck who liked me, Matt. Do you know what I mean? But I'm like, oh, so I spent three weeks in a house, and now I'm a nice person, like, I always, I always knew I was a good person. Do you know what I'm saying? So, but I'm I'm a human being. I've made mistakes, just like the average the average person. But do I have, do I have evil in my heart? Do I set out to hurt people? No, I don't. Would I help anyone that I love? Yes, I would. So, I think doing Big Brother just, especially that I got to the final. Um, I think that this like, yeah, it made it made people have to eat their words a bit. Any particular challenges or people people that you met or experiences that were, were super fun or super memorable? I love Big Brother. There's not one negative negative experience for me in Big Brother. It was wicked. I got on with everyone. Like there was obviously certain characters that was a bit, you know, I won't be they won't be saved in my address book after I left Big Brother. But I don't really have a terrible word to say about anyone. Do you know what I mean? There was a lot of people, a few people in there with issues, and then you see a lot of people that are doing it to like play up to the camera, you know what I mean? And I realise how insecure some people in the public eye are. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and badmouth it because I had fun, man. It was a right laugh. And I've still got, like, Ashley McKenzie, who was the, he's, he's an Olympian. He was a young boy that was in the Olympics. He's a, he's a um, judo, judo boy. He's, me and him are still friends. Meet, meet up with Ashley all the time. He's like my little brother. Um, Colleen Colleen Nolan Colleen, oh, yeah. Colleen's cool Martin Kemp Martin's cool um, I caught Martin out a few times Because When we When I when I came out of Big Brother Me and Martin actually presented Another show for Channel 5 Because we was popular But um, I like Martin But he was a bit devious Because he's one of them guys Especially because he's an actor too But I, I, did, I, did, I did have to pull him up on something Because I remember one time there was three of us. There was me, Ashley, 
and a guy called The Situation who was in Jersey Shore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mike's The Situation yeah. Sorrentino. Yes, yeah. And I love... <laughs> I, I, only know, I used to live in Vegas for like five right. years back in like 2008 to 2013 and every fucking night could be a go-to. It'd be, you know, DJ yeah. Mike The Sorrentino uh, yeah. Situation. But I love him. Like, another boy, got a fucking good heart. When I went to New York, that boy, we had a cracking time. I met up with him in New York, but I didn't... Martin went on the show and he said... um. In the diary room, he says, you know, it seems like him, um, the situation, Harvey and Ashley are forming a gang culture. And I was like, and I and I, I didn't see it until I came out of the house. And I thought, that's poor from you, Martin, because you sound like everyone else. Three boys. So me and you sit here now and another guy sits down. We're a gang. That's all I've heard, heard all my life. I've heard it from So Solid. I've heard it as a young black man. You know, why is it when... Other cultures sit together, you know? If Okay, if it was the situation, Ashley, right, and another white guy, you wouldn't have called them a gang. But I made it a gang, didn't I? Because I'm Harvey from So Solid. And I lost a bit, slight bit of respect from him. He's a good guy, but I had to pull him up about that. And I was like, that's poor from him. It's poor from him, because he should know better. Especially being in the craze. Fucking hell. He's a played Reggie Ronnie Crane, you're calling me, <laughs> and you got the cheek to say, I'm in gang culture. But apart from that, yeah, it was a good experience, man. But with anyone with Big Brother, I just say to people, like, just take the check and run, man. The producers don't care about you. You know what I mean? I got respect for one woman at that show, the woman that gave it to me, a woman called Ros Phillips. She's had my back from day. She's the one that put me in all the shows on TV, but it's so fake, man. I mean, I mean, when you say take the check and run in the context of Big Brother, I mean, yeah. w would you apply that across across the celebrity and media industry in general? I mean, 100%. do you think anyone gives a fuck about you in any programme? They don't give a fuck about you, bro. I remember when I came out of Big Brother, and I really hope she's watching this woman. When I walked in there, and do you know what? My agent, Jason, will know this woman is. There was one of the big producers. Yeah? There was one of the big producers. She was a woman, but I, I could see, I was like... You, you represent what TV is. You're just like a devil. Do you know what I mean? I could see it. And what it was, I played the game. Because what they said to me, as I was going in, there was her and another male producer. And they went, oh, there's loads of women in there for you, Harvey. Loads. So they, they probably thought, we got him. He's going to go in there and he's going to be a womanizer. And he's going to be this. But not knowing, I'm not a fucking womanizer. I've made mistakes. I've had an affair. I'm human. Do you know what I mean? But um, they thought I was going to go in there and be this reckless geezer. I mean, people see how intelligent I was and how clued on I was. Because I wasn't getting sucked into some of these games. And um, when I came out, you could see she was fuming that people liked me when I came out. She barely spoke to me when I came out of the house. I was sitting with my agents and I was like, you are what TV represents. You are the devil. Because you wanted me to go in there and fuck up myself. You, you put me in this house to give me a check, hoping that people will hate me more. Do you know what I mean? But I, I never forget it. My agents, yeah? God bless Jason. I love this guy with a passion, him and his dad. We was meeting. When I found out I got it, we used to meet every week in a restaurant. Harvey, you know what they're going to try and do to you? Harvey. And I said to the, I said, to, I know. I know. I'm switched on. You know, they're going to try and portray you like that. And they didn't get it. Because it's not who I am. I'm just, like I said, I, I reiterate again. I'm just a normal guy. That's just made a few mistakes along the way. How do you prepare a man for success at 20 years old? How do you prepare a man to sell 8 million records? Give me checks of a quarter of a million pound publishing deals for another quarter million pound, put me on TV. I got, at the time, I got a wife who's also a celebrity. Um, I got women throwing themselves at me. And Matt, I'm not going to make mistakes. Get the fuck out of here, man. Who the, who the hell knows mm -hmm. everything at 20 years old? So do you know what? When I look at my mistakes now, it's funny enough I said this. People now, it's weird. People come up to me and they go, oh, I love your family. And they go, proper family, man. And... Well, my friend said, it's weird, it's weird. Say, calling you that back then and now, when I look at you as a family man and how much you love your wife and your family, I, I can't, I don't know who that person is. I said to my friend, well, imagine that, the same people over there that are now calling me a family man, the same people that call me a womanizer. It's all fickle. It's all fickle, man. That's why these people, I take the industry for what it is. I take it with a pinch of fucking salt. And I take everything out of it that they gave me. And I don't look back. Do you know what I mean? And I don't owe no one shit. The only people that I owe shit is my mother and my real agent and my real friends that stuck by me, Matt, through thick and thin. The good times and the bad times. Because a lot of people live the good li life of my life, Matt. 
No one was complaining when they're in five-star hotels, when they're on first class on the plane, or they're getting all the Harvey groupies, all the Harvey attention. No one's complaining then. But when it gets bad... Mental health. Mm. I remember sitting in the room one time going, who have I got? A few. As a wise man said, you can count them on your hands. And what and what's your advice to whether it's to your younger self or to or to or to somebody somebody else in that position? Because I mean, I totally agree agree with everything you're saying, and I think you know because I talk about it in the context context of business a lot. Because you know, I, I, a lot of my peers or you know or people who have business, and you, they they get they get very upset about you know I don't know, when staff leave or when mm. staff do something to them. Uh, you know or how how different things are. You know after this person who's worked for them for five years yeah. does something else in 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 in, in another life. And I always say that you just have to desensitize yourself to yeah, it because the, the, the only way to prepare yourself for it is to know it just is what it is. And I always, you know, once someone's off the payroll, you know, they don't give a fuck about you. Well, there you go. You know, you, you may think that your best mate, your best mates at work, okay, one in a million have genuine friendships that Correct. completely transcend the money. Correct. But but the reality is, you know, you can get on, but there's a difference between getting on while whilst you're at work uh, and, and whether whether or not whether or not you'll be mates afterwards. And you know, the, and ninety nine percent of People who, who work for you will happily leave tomorrow for ten percent more, twenty percent more. Will. And you know, and, and why? Why shouldn't they? I think all for me, it's almost, it's not that they're wrong. It's that you're kidding yourself by getting yourself upset about it because it just it just fucking is what it is. And you've both got to take the best of each other, other while, whilst you're still there. So true. And you know, it's mad that you said that. A wise man said to me, um, Albert Samuels, my manager, said to me, and never forget this. He went, Harvey. He went. You're too emotional, yeah? Don't show no emotion in business. Take it for what it is, exactly what you just said. Matt, two weeks ago, I had to sack someone that worked for me for seven years. But I don't care. Because you see, if anyone that works with me, and like you said, I've desensitised myself. I've been through so much. I literally sat the person and I got on with my day. What was the circumstances of it? Oh, but yeah, again, um, you, you present an opportunity to people and because they they end up coming around my wealthy circles of people that I know and the connections that they have, what do they try and do? They try and miss you out and look after themselves, don't you? Not knowing that anyone that works around me now is loyal. So the person, what did the person do? The wealthy person, that's my good friend, Tell ring you. me straight away because they're loyal. And I went, wow, because that person was looking to look after themselves. And I went, I, I don't get emotional. I got home, spoke to my best friend, my, my wife, I went, babes, get rid of it. We don't have no snakes around us no more. And see, Matt, what I always say to anyone that works for me, I've got my brand, Team Harvey. You know, we put on the charity football games. We do a number of events. I don't have a problem with any of my staff making mistakes because we all do. But you see, when you cross me with loyalty, goodbye. Because you can, we can work together. I can make a mistake. Just a genuine work mistake or that don't bother me. We, we rebuild. We're a team. Okay, I'll pick you up. You didn't mean it. But when you do something that is crossing the line of loyalty, loyalty, I won't even take the risk, Matt. I won't even entertain it to give you another day, another chance. I will just get rid of you. That simple. Because sometimes being, I used to like give people a chance that cross the line of loyalty. And then you wonder why the problem gets worse further down the line. Because if they're not loyal in the beginning, how the fuck are they going to be loyal yeah. further down the line? And it's the same aspect that I say with my agent now, Jason, that is next door, and that is my business partner. That's one of the most loyal people I fucking know. That guy's had my back through thick and thin. He's one that's had to deal with newspapers calling, all the bad stuff. He's had to deal with situations when I've been broke, when I've had money, when I've nearly gone bankrupt, all these things. And this guy's just had my back. I've been in moments when I've been on my face in my in my 25 career. Jason, I'm on my face. There you go, man. There's six grand. I, I am your agent, but you're also my friend. And I know you'll get yourself back on your feet. How many people would do that, do that to you? I have even I, ha I haven't even made that money at mm -hmm. the time. I know you'll make it back. So I know what you're about. That's why people like him, a couple of my friends, and my family that I can't manage, I'll do anything for them. Because I've just seen, I've seen how they've treated me in fucking bad times. 
and I've put these people through hell. <laughs> I've inconvenienced their life, but they never give up on me. So, uh, ha having yeah. seen how bad people can be to you, does that ever make you, I guess, change the way that you behave to other people? I don't mean those same people, but like you know, um, obviously you're clearly a very, a very positive person, a very lo mm. loyal person. But when you see how many, you know, how many cunts are around, yeah, does that make you? be less positive and less and want to be less loyal to other people or do you just think well it just is what it is i'm not gonna i'm not gonna change my good nature for anyone I, what you just said i'm not changing my good nature for anyone because i'm a happy person i love life and i love being around good people and i love having a laugh and i like i, I love seeing people happy do you know what i mean but i have zero tolerance to bad energy so my people know me don't fuck with Harvey, bro, because he would just cut you off like that with no delay. I do not want to sit in a room with a negative person. I don't want to sit in a person sitting here in a room with a person whose mindset is just morbid. How's that gonna uplift me? Why do I want you around me? The shit that I've been through in my career. Mate, like I said to you, where I'm hitting nearly 26 years in this business. What do you think I haven't seen? I've seen most of it. I always say in life, you're always learning every day, no matter how old you get. But zero tolerance. Zero tolerance to negative people. Zero tolerance to people that ain't loyal. Zero tolerance, man. That's my motto, mate. I don't want you around me. I don't want your energy near me. Stay away from me. I won't let you into my life. I'm very, even if I put on a party, Matt, every person that is in that room, I would know who is in that room. I am a controller of my own destiny. I am a controller of my own energy. There's not a rule saying that I have to be around fucked up people. Because I've been around enough. I've been around gangsters, devils, you name it, mate. I've been around all of them. Nah. Don't enhance your life. I surround myself with people that have the same mindset as me. But remember, you don't learn these things just like that. You don't wake up and go, I know all these things. This is out of me fucking up, man. Making loads of mistakes, having loads of things done to me. You see right now in this present day and age, 2023, the devil is working overtime, Matt. Look at the things that we are seeing. We don't, I don't know what's going on. They want all these genres and genders and uh, like, this is not the normal world to me. You know, the things that, the visuals that you're putting out there for my kids to see. Get the fuck out of here. My kids ain't following these visuals. They're devil visuals. Where do you think it's coming from? The social media. No, so, but yeah, but but what, uh, what, why? Oh, people, uh, I think that people are prepared to sell their souls for anything in this in this current climate. Um, people want more. They, but they, when I say people want more, they're not doing it with a good, they're not going the right route. People will just do anything to be successful now or anything to have money, even if it means taking out your own. Or it's, it's this devil. Even a lot of, you know, prime example, Russell Brand, yeah? I was like, here we go. His time now. Russell's time to get taken out now. They've been waiting to take him out. Because anyone that talks sense and that is fully in tune with the world, yeah? And that sees, there is another world. That, as we know, there's the government and there's a lot of fuckery and there's a lot of hidden rooms that we don't know about. This is how the industries run, my guy. Unless you're sitting in the rooms of these TV people or you're not playing the game and you're not in these little secret masonry rooms, yeah? Well, you can't come on with us. And if you're speaking out of tune and you're going against us, we're going to take you out. Now's Russell Brand's time. But do you think, therefore, I mean, do you think Russell hasn't done anything? Do you think it's all made up stuff? Or? No, I don't think he helps himself, but he talks a lot of sense. But they were just waiting to find the loophole. Do you understand what I'm mm. saying? They, you got to look at some some cases, yeah. But, but, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but, but what, what you're saying is you, you think he has done what he's done, but but they're, and they're, they're now using that to shut him down. Yeah, hundred percent. But yeah. surely, but surely that's not justification for what he's done. Not at all. Not at all justification. But they was as I said, they was waiting. They was waiting for something they, they could bang him to rights, Matt. You know what I mean? Because he's intelligent, too intelligent. So he thought, fuck, we need to find somewhere where we can. What's the new thing now? Cancel people. And he gave it to them. And that's it now. Every day I'm I'm in the car. Like Radio One, Russell Brand. BBC Two, Russell Brand. The media, Russell Brand. Twitter, Russell Brand. I'm like, here it goes. Here's the union coming for you. And now you made it easy for them.
course it don't justify it. Of course it don't. But they was waiting for that. They was waiting for it. Because he's 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 too in he's too in tune. He's almost too intelligent for his own good. So they was waiting for something that they can go, ha, we've got you now. And that's the way the world, that's the way the world works. And I mean, who do you think it is pulling the strings behind these people? Uh, in, in the TV world, like, I'm going to keep it 100%, man. Like, there's masonry within TV. You know about masonry, man. I'm sure you do. I mean, I know what, I, I, I know what it is. I don't you know, know much is, about it. You know it, what but... I'm saying? Like, there's masonry, bro. Like, or I want to say that is, when you watch films like The Kingsman, they've all got messages in them. In them. Because formerly these films, they're like cults. They're like, you have people that kind of like, that control the industry. Certain rooms that you got to sit in to get further in your career. These things exist, my friend. These things exist. I'll tell you first time they exist. Do you, I mean, think I, do you think I haven't been approached? I mean, I was going to say, during your career, you know, what, what, what kind of things have you seen or been Mate, offered to further your career? Like I said, first and foremost, I'm not going to go deep into these things. But yeah, oh, it th th is about, mate. It's about, do you know what I mean? Oh, oh, sit with that, sit with that producer, or do what, that. what? What do they want? And like I said, you don't have to tell yeah. me some specific thing. But what? What do they want you to do to further your? Or what do they want someone to do to further? Well, what they their say career? is, anyone that has the influence, um, the power to influence a mass amount of people, yeah, they will use you for what they need to use you for. We wish to get a message out there, or we wish you to, you know, get onto that TV show. Why is it? You got to look at people like Dave Chappelle. He didn't play the game, and his career halted. Dave Chappelle, this is a legend. This is like an icon to comedy. And then he started talking about it, but he went deep into it. It's Luminati, it's this. And he started exposing rooms. And next year, he didn't, he didn't work. And you're like, wow. But do you think as well, I mean, I, mean, there's, I was going to say double-edged sword, but that, that's, that's the wrong, wrong, wrong expression. I guess nowadays, like we were talking about uh, Dapper uh, before mm. he came on camera. And uh, obviously, I mean, he was an example of someone who, you know, years ago got cancelled. But as a career, uh, but from a career move, he, he's, he's uh, probably done better now than he's done then because, yeah. because of the um, power of social media, be, yeah, of because of the, I Thank guess, democratization of, of how content can be delivered. You know, he puts on his own shows and he fi finds other ways to, exactly. other ways to make money. So I guess, yes, yes, the big people, you know, the big people can cancel you. You know, if you're controlling channel four, you're controlling channel three, uh, you know, ITV, whatever, yeah. you know, yes, someone can pull the plug, but with your social media and stuff, you know, you, you've got, you've got the power still to, to bit make a career. So I guess if we like use Russell as an example, I mean he he could ha happily exist forever, you know, yeah. on social media channels, do, you know, doing what he wants to do, yeah. giving whatever message he wants to give against you know the Illuminati, against the Matrix yeah. or whatever. But he's also fucked it for himself because he's done something he, abs he yeah. absolutely shouldn't have done. Yeah. So I guess as long as I guess as long as you're not a criminal, as long as you're not, you know, as long as you can keep your dick in your pants on the right on the right occasion, there is still the power for you to have, so the, not the power, but the ability for you to spread your message nowadays, isn't there? The avenue, but agreed, but the avenue of making the big check in that world is gone now. Yeah. And the, that's, that's all. So, like you said, just like a dapper, people like myself, dappers, bro, we're multi-talented, we'll always find a way. But it's in terms of like, if you look at Dapper, like Dapper's numbers, his numbers are ridiculous. His numbers are numbers that should be on TV because mm. he has the fan base, he has the audience, and he's a person. He should have his own show. We've you gave him a show on. Well, his numbers are bigger than TV, aren't they? Yeah, literally. So we've you gave him a show on BBC Three, we gave him on Sky, Wh whatever it is, whatever platform these days, or he was on a big YouTube channel, whatever it is, to give him that big check. They're not going to give it to him because they've already, you know, like I said. You made that mistake, and that's who you are for the rest of your life. So we're done with you, yeah? And you will not work here ever again. It's an absolute joke. That is one of the most genuine, nicest blokes I know. Family orientated, man. Our families are close. We go around this house every Christmas, Boxing Day, and we have the best laugh, and I love the guy with a passion, and I'd help him through anything. I know someone that wakes up with bad intentions, or someone that's evil, or someone that you know, was meant to rock the boat of the industry. Nah, not Dapper. Not Dapper, man. See, Dapper, another one, he's almost too smart for his own good. <laughs> All of us that are too smart for our own good, they always want to do some form of, they want to halt us, they want to control us. Ain't no one controlling me, bro. Ain't no, ain't no TV producer controlling me. Ain't, I don't give a shit if you're the key holder to, I don't know, put me on this big show. I'd rather sit in my house 
and formulate my own product like I, like I always have done. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like I always have done. I don't, I don't care. I'd rather keep my dignity, yeah, and keep my mindset and my respect than sell my soul to the devil. There's a big difference in playing the game and selling your soul, Matt. Big difference. I could play the game. Of course. There's some... I remember when we done... Um, when 21 Seconds came out and our manager said, look, you got a meeting with the head of Radio 1. Just have a meeting. Just to, no, 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 you know, just meet you guys, see what you guys are like and, you know, think smart because if they support your record, you've got a hit on your hands. I get that. That's called networking and that's called being business. My, and Alex Donnelly, the head of Radio 1 at the time, top guy, sat with him. Oh, we had a right laugh. He was just like, I just wanted to sit with you guys and just know where your, what your vision is and where you want to take this and... And by the time we came at the meeting, Alex Donnelly was like, love these dudes, man. I love their energy. We're going to support them. That's networking. Do you understand? That's playing the game. But then selling your soul. I had a producer of a, of a national TV channel tell me to, that I should sleep with a producer knowing I've got a wife to think of bettering my career. So I'm not going to name names because I'm not stupid. That's what I think, you know... I've, with a lot of these guys, yeah, where they're getting so passionate and outspoken, they're just like naming people and do you know what I mean? I'm like, you're just making it easy for them. Like, with me, I'd rather say the situation, and if you're sitting at home, you know who you are. <laughs> but I wouldn't even give you the glory of naming your name. They asked me to go and meet a producer at three o'clock in the morning in Miami to sleep with her, to think of my career, while the week before you're smiling with my wife at the TV channel. It's the devil, man. It's the devil. It's the devil. And I'm not playing these games. I don't give a shit if you don't put me on none of your shows. I don't care. My brand's been strong for years. I give back. You know, my charity, Dom's Food Mission, Feed the Homeless, Boot Hunger Out. Well, let's let's you know talk I mean? let's talk talk a bit about that because I was gonna say, I mean, um I, I could I could talk to you for hours, but I'm, yeah. I'm conscious conscious of time as of well. Uh, and I want I want to talk a bit about charity mm. and, uh, and what you're up to now. I know you've got a charity football match around the corner as yeah. well. So I mean, is it is charity been with you since since the beginning of your career or is it something you've started to give back to more now? Probably focus on it. Fo always give, give back because you've got to think to yourself, all the TV shows that I've done, I was raising money for the Sierra Leone War Trust Funds because my grandfather was from Sierra Leone and obviously for Sickle Cell. So all the big shows that you see me do in my life, the games, the matches, I've made fortunes for, the, for, for these charities because it means a lot to me. First and foremost, Sickle Cell because that can, you know, it's only with people of colour that can get it. So it meant a lot to me because I've seen people that I know have had Sickle Cell and how they suffered from it. And the Sierra Leone... Um, War Trust Fund, it's my grandfather, it's my heritage. I went back to Freetown. I've seen my people. I've seen how less fortunate people are. But my mum, like I said, it was a youth worker of the community. My mum always used to say to me, son, giving back is more fucking rewarding than receiving. And I agree with you, mum. Because if I'm in a position where I can change people's lives or make people feel better or uplift them, that makes me feel glorious when I go to bed at night. It makes me feel more glorious than giving me a cheque for half a million quid, mate. Knowing that someone's benefiting out of this, that's suffering. So when I came on board with Dom's Food Mission, bless Marlon Harewood, ex-West Ham legend, my good friend, who me and him put a charity game together and I met Dom through Marlon and I seen what they stood for and I seen how selfless these people were. Um, getting up seven o'clock in the morning, do food bank, going to people's houses all over like Hastings, Brighton and dropping food to people that are suffering to their doors. Unbelievable. I said, I've got, to, I've got to be a part of this. You know, Marlon was an ambassador. I then became an ambassador. Now we're getting massive now. I've now just got Patrick Van Arnholt, professional footballer, who's now at PSV, you know, Crystal Palace, Chelsea player. Um, to now be on board. That's why I flew to Holland this week. This weekend, me and Dom went over to Holland to go and visit Patrick and his wife. Three months ago, he's now an ambassador. Elliot, Elliot Lee, centre midfielder, Rob Lee's son for Wrexham. Just building because when it comes to kids and people suffering, I don't like that shit. Feed the homeless, boot hunger out. Food and health and strength is our fuel. No fuel, no healthy mat. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Bills ain't getting paid. You're suffering. I love giving back, man. I love seeing the smile, the smile on them kids' faces. 
I love seeing the joy in someone when you've done something for them. Um, I had a kid come down to my event the other day. What was the event? Um, I done. It was Team Harvey versus Arsenal Legends. Oh, another football game. Yeah, because I obviously this is my fourth year now. And um, how often do a game? I do probably three, four games a year. It's my fourth year. So this year we've already done um, one against Bedair, which is a mental health charity. We've done West Ham Legends, Arsenal Legends, um, Charlton Legends, you name it. All, all my games against ex-pro sides and the next one's against Reading. And a kid came down who's, who was, um, he's been getting bullied from up north, from up your way. And one of the boys from So Solid, a lovely boy, um, said, look, got, got in touch with his family. I said, bring the family down. We'll look after him. Bring them down. And the kid was getting nasty, like really bullied by these guys. And um, I met the kid. I said, listen, them days are over. I said, you got so solid behind you now. That's never going to happen again. And we put his family in hospitality and they met the, you know, he met all the ex-pros and just to see the smile on the kid's face and how his confidence built and how he felt when he left that building and meeting me. And you can see he just felt like invincible and I could see the joy in his face and... Uh, it was so rewarding because you can see that this kid's been absolutely terrorised by these lads up and up north. They're these horrible little shitty bullies. I hate bullies. I hate them. I love bullying a bully. I love it. it gives me so much joy because how can, you know, some, not everyone can defend themselves. Not everyone's got confidence. Some people are introverts. Some people are extroverts. And you're going to take set on a weaker person. No, take set on me. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I hate bullies with a fucking passion, Matt. With a passion. It's a cop-out. When you're a bully, it's a weak mindset. You're just preying on the weak. Mm -hmm. And I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Something I say about all the boys in So Solid, yeah? People don't get enough credit yet. The boys don't get enough credit. One thing that the boys never tolerated in our group was bullies and anyone that took Class A drugs. I could tell you an incident, yeah? Where we found out someone... Um, no, they wasn't in the crew, but someone affiliated to the crew was taking Class A drugs. If I tell you the way that was dealt with, the way the boys dealt with it, mate. <clears throat> wouldn't tolerate it. People are like, you see them type of drugs? They make you thief of your own fucking family. They make you do things that's unrecognisable. Don't fucking come near so solid with that type of behaviour. Do you know what I mean? I don't like any drug that, you know, changes people's character. Yeah, I respect the man that's been through it. Dappers, I've got friends that have been through it. I'd help you all day. I'd help you get out of it. But don't just continue to do it. You know what I'm saying? If you know that it's destroying your life. Because no one's perfect. We've all been there. We've all got addictions. But if you just keep going back, back to visit the devil, you keep going back to him, that's your fault. Don't visit the devil and ask when something negative or terrible happens to you. That's on you. Life's all about decisions, Matt. Well, look, 25 years mm. of, uh, of career, uh, yeah. m m many, many stories, uh, I guess, you know, a, a lot of lessons learned along the way. If we have to wrap this up in a couple of sentences, yeah. you know, what, what is what is the the one one single piece of advice you want you want to tell, you know, 18 year old, 14 year old Harvey, um, you know, back then? To any young man or young girl. Just be good to people, man. Just wake up with good intentions, man, and live your life, man, and wake up with a smile on your face and everything you, anything you do in your life, just give it 100%. I've not said more than two words, but <laughs> just wake up with a good heart, man, and work hard. God never judged a trier. That's the best way to put it. Just work hard, man. You know, and don't worry about social media. Stop looking at all these visuals and thinking you got to be like that. You're not battling against social media. Be battling against yourself but with the right mindset. Be like, you know, could be better, but for yourself. Well, Harvey, it's been an absolute pleasure, Thanks mate. Thanks for having me, Matt. And I could go on for hours and hours. And I, I, really, know, I, really, I really hope uh, we get to do a round two sometime. Definitely. Yeah, actually, we were talking before this, um, saying I want to do a round two with Dapper as yeah. well. So maybe, maybe, maybe we should have a little, uh, a little round table. We should, bro. We should. I mean, it'd be lovely. There's, a, be... Few, there's a few topics. I'm going to see him we, this week, so I'm going to speak to him. We'll mention it to yeah, him. There's a definitely a few topics that we can uh, we can get deep into. Yeah, together, man. So. It'd be good to have Dapper at this table because he, he's done fantastic for his own life too. He's in such a good place right now, so respect to him. Awesome. Well, thanks again for Thank being here. Thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks for having me.